hello and welcome to season seven of the Mundane to Magical online summit series. My name is Louise Matson, and as always, I am truly blessed to be your host. Today, I'm really excited to welcome another brand new speaker to the summit, David Farrell. We had a few little internet glitches at the start, but we're all good to go now. David is a plant shaman who comes from an Irish Cornish background and his Celtic roots form a strong part of his healing and shamanic practices. He's trained plant healer, plant spirit healer, crystal healer, geomancer and you mysteries initiate and has also been initiated into a long lineage of Quechua tobaqueros from the Ecuadorian Amazon rainforest. He spent three years in India and Italy studying Tibetan Buddhism deeply in semi-monastic centers and has taken teachings and empowerments from the Dalai Lama and Dagri Rinpoche, as well as other Lamas and Rinpoches. He brings all of these different modalities into his teaching and healing and works a lot with his ancient ancestors in the land. He co-founded the groundbreaking events, Gateways of the Mind, Plant Consciousness and the Shamanic Lands, as well as co-founding the online TV platform WisdomHub.tv, where he is the lead interviewer and curator. David now resides in Mexico, where he offers quantum remote healing and occasionally runs plant medicine retreats, working with various sacred plants, cacti and fungus. Now, the topic for today's conversation is the magic of plant spirit healing, working with the quantum intelligence of nature. My personal journey over the last few years has seen me connecting more and more with Mother Earth and the plant kingdom. And in particular, I've found myself guided to work with plant medicine in various ways, including working with a shaman in Colombia and working with plant tinctures and essences in my everyday life to assist my physical body as well as my spiritual journey of embodiment. I am really excited to connect with David and to speak about plant medicine and plant spirit healing. And so it's my absolute pleasure and honor to welcome you to the show, David. Thank you, Louise. It's an absolute delight to be here. And uh, thank you for that introduction and also for sharing a little bit about uh, your own connection to plants. I find uh, everybody's plant stories and journeys to be super interesting, you know, um, because that's, that's part of the connection. And it's interesting to see which plants speak to which people and what directions that take them in, you know. So uh, yes, yeah, very, very, uh, uh, humble and um, delighted to be here. So thank you very much for the opportunity to chat to you and your audience. No, it's my absolute pleasure. Um, I normally ask people to share about their journey and how they connected with the work, but I thought I would put your longer bio under the video so that we could get straight into the topic, if that's okay. Sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the title is The Magic of Plant Spirit Healing, Working with the Quantum Intelligence of Nature. So shall we start with what plant spirit healing is for those people in the audience who might never have come across it? Sure, so um, probably the best place to start with, with the plant spirit healing is actually the inception of uh, plant consciousness uh, to kind of take it back to how it started for me. And it was really the first time that I sat in a teepee uh, somewhere in a field in Britain drinking ayahuasca. And it was the first time I'd been with that medicine. This is, well, quite a long time ago now. And I already had an idea for an event circulating around in my mind because uh, we were organizing gateways of the mind at that time in the shamanic lands. And there was something coming to, to both me and Emma at that time about sustainable communities and working with uh, harmony with Mother Earth. And it was a mixture of things. I hadn't really settled on what it was gonna be. And pretty much the first thing the medicine told me was like that idea that you have for an event, it needs to be about how you humans communicate with us plants. <laughs> <laughs> and I just sat down, I thought, wow, that's, yeah. And, and you know, so that, that kind of, that's where plant consciousness, the event was born. I then went away and researched it. And actually at that point I was living in, in Italy at the semi-monastic center or studying there where me and Emma were both studying um, Tibetan Buddhism at the time. And uh, I had a practice of doing nettle tea meditations in the morning, which is, you know, interesting because one of the famous uh, ascended masters from the Tibetan Buddhism tradition is Milarepa, who actually started life off as a sorcerer. And then um, he became a good guy, so to speak. And uh, he meditated for 20 years in a cave. And the only thing that he consumed every day was a cup of nettle tea that was brought to him by uh, his, his followers or his helpers or whatever. And so often when you see Milarepa in, in the tankers and pictures, he's depicted with green skin and green hair because of the nettles. Ah. So, uh, you know, so because of that and because I aspired to be a little bit like Milarepa in my early student days of being a Tibetan Buddhist, I decided I would do nettle tea meditations. And one morning, shortly after the ayahuasca journey, I was sat there uh, drinking my nettle tea in the morning 
and it just came so clearly the, the name for the event needs to be plant consciousness brother and this is how it's going to feel and it was so clear and so obvious i'm just like how come nobody else has thought of this um so i went away and researched it, and that led me to pam montgomery's book about plant spirit healing where she actually used the phrase plant consciousness Mm -hmm. So that really then began a journey uh, with Pam herself, which lasted for a number of years, about five or six years. We studied under her, we hosted her, um, and she taught us how to communicate with the conscious intelligence of plants. So that's another way that we can describe a plant spirit is the conscious intelligence. It's the same way that us humans have a higher self mm -hmm. that we can communicate with, but down here, this is the 3D meat bag suit that we wear. It's the same for plants. Mm -hmm. You know, they also have their 3D suit that they wear. And... I've come to a place of sort of merging my um, learnings with Buddhism and with the plants to understand that many plants, particularly the strong medicine plants, are what we might call in Buddhism bodhisattvas. Mm. They're beings that have become very realized and they've come back to assist because they can. You know, if you think about a plant really, or even a tree, its sole kind of, you know, purpose is just to give. Yeah. It gives freely, it doesn't ask anything in return. You know, sure, we might like to give gifts as as an act of exchange, but the plant will give its medicine really anyway, unless you treat it really badly, in which case it might not. But, uh, um, you know, so when I think about that and I think about the qualities of giving and healing and teaching uh, without any need for anything in response, that makes me think of the sort of the vows of the Bodhisattva to help heal all beings throughout all eternity until everybody is enlightened. So it's kind of a big job, right? A yeah. uh, pretty endless kind of job too. Um, but, you know, once you kind of have been on the path long enough, you start to realize that, hey, actually, if I'm an eternal being, what am I going to do for the rest of eternity, right? So I may as well sign up to helping people because what else am I going to do? You know, but I certainly wasn't thinking that about uh, 10, 11 years ago when I was uh, studying all of this. I'm just like, wow, man, I'm really going to look after everybody in the universe. Like, when's that job ever going to end? Uh, and then I realized that was the point. It's not meant to. <laughs> it's meant to keep you occupied doing wholesome activity. So I kind of think of plants like that. So, you know, what I'm trying to do is bring in to sort of the space here, a picture of how plant intelligence can be viewed and how we can communicate with plants. And, you know, it's, you know, for, for me, I've, I've done so many diets now with plants and I'll talk a little bit more about that maybe in, in a while. And I've gone so deep with so many plants, not just the entheogens like ayahuasca and the mushrooms and San Pedro and all of those plants, but actually, you know, also the, the hedgerow plants, mm -hmm. the trees from the forest, uh, you know, the, the plants from the fields. I mean, these are all incredibly powerful plants. And, and it's a bit like learning a new language. You know, I find that the plants talk to me all the time. I mean, particularly a plant like dandelion, which I'm going to talk more about in a bit. It's, you know, it's, it's a different language. They speak to us in a different way. It's not like picking up the telephone and having a conversation with your buddy, you know, uh, somewhere else in the world where, you know, it's kind of English is spoken. It's very much, I find with the plants, it's often synchronicities and they ask you to pay attention. And particularly dandelion, he's very much about the present moment and the plants really teach us to be present because when you're in the presence of a plant and you want to work with the plant, either to make medicine, to make an essence, to harvest, you have to be with the plant. You can't be thinking about breakfast or the row that you had with your partner or the guy that, you know, that's annoyed you, you took your parking space or whatever, because otherwise that comes into the medicine. It changes the frequency of what you're co-creating. And so I, I find that plants really ask us to, to be present. And the more that you do that through making medicine and being in the garden, the more when you go out into the forest, the more you start to see your friends everywhere. And then the forest becomes alive with a sort of a chatter. And then you start to observe other things like, why is that plant going there? You know, like, um, so a classic one that I would find is St. John's wort would often be found growing down railway lines or uh, disused railway lines. Yeah. And, you know, what is it about St. John's Wart that it, that it wants to grow on these disused places? It wants to bring back the light. It wants to heal. It wants to, to transform the scar in the landscape. And so, you know, another one is Herb Robert. Um, we used to find a lot of this in Wales. And Herb Robert is actually really good for removing heavy metals. So you often find it in places where there's been a lot of mining or a lot of quarrying because the earth is disturbed and it's releasing heavy metals into the atmosphere. Yeah. So plants are doing this kind of work all the time without us even knowing about it. And it's only when we start to engage with them and we observe how they are, what they like to grow next to, which areas they like to grow in, how come they always seem to grow in certain environments. And that starts to build up the personality of the plant, right? Because if you think it's a being, the same as I'm a being manifesting currently in the form that you see here and you are too, it's the yeah. same for the plants, you know, but these are very, very realized beings, particularly the, the master teacher plants. And so it's like making a friendship with another human, making a friendship with a plant being is making a friendship or an alliance for healing with another very, very sophisticated being. And I think for me, once I started to move more into the space 
of seeing plants in this way, uh, then everything started to change. And, you know, plants will appear to us in different ways. For example, wormwood, which is a plant I want to talk about too. Mm -hmm. I mean, that plant has appeared to me in so many different guises, each one equally relevant, equally important, equally true. But according to the moment, that's how the plant wanted to present itself so that I would understand something. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so plant spirit healing, you know, is working in the quantum space with the quantum intelligence of plants and when we work in the quantum space everything can happen very quickly so that's how i'm able to do my healings remotely without needing to uh, have the client in the room and i actually find these days it's much easier to work that way because it removes the kind of almost like the human from the equation which can often have resistance and obstruction to healing and i just work with the four fourth dimensional astral self and the higher self of the fifth dimension sometimes maybe six or seven two depending on the client and then we work at the uh, energy level of removing attachments blockages things that we might call curses or hexes or entities or whatever all of that kind of stuff mm -hmm. but i work in tandem with my allies so i have an ally that helps me remove this i have another plant that helps me remove that and so uh, it's a co-creation and the plants love it and you know um for those people who watch uh, pam gregory's astrology uh, show and she often talks about uh, zach the ascended master mm -hmm. i've had several sessions with zach over the last six months and we talked a lot about uh this this work with um with the plants and, and he said that this is he, he believes or, or, you know from his lofty position that this is the future of healthcare it's quantum it's self-applied and it's in co-creation with mother earth and in the end once we start to do this on a regular basis we find that the potentiality to get sick gets reduced because uh once we understand that sickness is, is an energy that we allow into our fields and then we decide that we don't want to allow it anymore we don't get sick anymore you know and i think that as a sort of a motif moving forwards into the the new paradigm the new earth however you want to call it what i've seen repeatedly or been shown repeatedly is that we will all be our own inner physicians and actually we, we won't need to uh, how to say um you know uh give our our health over to somebody else to take care of we can take care of it ourselves we will all be our own shamans all be our own medicine people and we can do that just by simply walking out into the garden you know there's that old adage in the herbalist world that in our garden we will find exactly the plants that we yeah. need right all we have to do is step outside be present and start to look around and see what's there it's like how come there's so much dandelion in my garden this year oh my god yeah my liver could do with a detox right it's that kind of thing so once we step into that space of communication and observation and being present suddenly everything changes mm -hmm. and you know for me it took a little while i mean uh, we have so much distortion in our society we have so much being projected at us right now we have so much toxicity right now all of that kind of stymies the flow of communication so the real trick i believe to this is getting energetically clean and clear sovereign on our boundaries so that we know exactly who we are once we know who we are we can start to ascertain what everything else is you know whether it's other people whether it's plants whether it's malignant energies whatever but until we know what what is ours it's very difficult to separate out and so it becomes difficult for a lot of people coming into uh, to working with plants in that way and wanting to communicate if their field is full of clutter mm -hmm. you know i sometimes say that my work as a healer is really uh, being a glorified garbage cleaner you know we just <laughs> go in remove all of the junk remove all of the crap and then just leave space for the client to actually experience what it's like to be by themselves because most people are carrying stuff that they've picked up from their parents, their family, their workplace. They've got things whispering in their ear, creating situations, creating troubles, trigger points. None of that's their stuff, man. That's stuff that they've picked up and inherited. And once that stuff is removed, then you're in a much more quiet to calmer space where you can really start to get to know your own energy intimately. Then it becomes much easier to communicate with, with plants and other beings. Absolutely. I mean, you've just <laughs> described what my work is as well. <laughs> just like, I specialize right. in extraction with shamanic healing. So it's like, you mm -hmm. know, just clearing out that which really shouldn't be there and has got mm -hmm. nothing to do with the individual that's in front of me and, and allowing them to come back and to get a feel for their own sovereign space. You know, yeah. who am I? Where do I start and stop? And that's basically what the message has been over the last, oh, oh, I don't know, 10 or so years now that's been coming through. Yeah. really know thyself and and manage your own energy field um so i mean that was that was a beautiful um kind of description of uh plant spirit healing and also plant consciousness and i love the fact that you you've sort of said that you know the plants are kind of showing their 3d cells because that's something that comes through for me all the time you know one of the things that i can't wait for is the 
the kind of the feeling that we can step out and actually all of us can be who we truly are and we can all show our highest aspects of selves and that includes the trees and the plants because the trees for me were my my friends when I was growing up you know they were pretty much the only ones that I could have a sensible conversation with that got me <laughs> so it's like it would be a lovely place to live in where we could actually connect in with those higher higher aspects but you know as you say we can do that through this work and it's funny because I've been drinking nettle tea every morning <laughs> hey I love it <laughs> very clean full of chlorophyll right it's surprisingly tasty I think I don't like all herbal teas but I do especially like nettles <laughs> yeah no it is. I'm for nettles too because it's one of the spring cleansing plants along with dandelion and cleavers you know nature's super clever right it, it gives us the plants that we need in the seasons that we need them and why do we have the the tonics the cleansing plants in spring because we're sludgy and heavy from winter you know once we kind of step into that medicine wheel of the seasons and we get to be a gardener we get to be a shamanic gardener it goes even deeper again and then you start to bring in the correspondences with the elements and it's endless for those of you out there who've got that kind of mind to play the world of plants and shamanism and healing is is endless there's, there's i mean how many plants are there in the world louise how many hundreds of thousands of species are there you know for people to be mugwort shamans nettle shamans dandelion shamans whatever you know these are all super powerful plants and and i love the fact that actually you're talking about working with what people would consider to be everyday plants you know, mm -hmm. the, the kind of plants that you do find in the hedgerow, the plants you do find in your garden. And, you know, they're not to be belittled. They're not they're not just weeds, as it were. You know, they are powerful healers, just like the ayahuascas and, you know, the other aspects of the, the plant kingdom that people associate with with plant healing, plant medicine. Um, and I think that's one of the key things that I wanted to kind of get across to people from this conversation is, you know, our medicine cabinet is out there literally on our doorstep and we just have to allow ourselves to start connecting with that and actually gaining that awareness of what really is just out there because as you say nature's put out there exactly what you need you know and and it doesn't matter where you are what country you're in you've got exactly the medicine cabinet you need in your garden or surrounding area so um it's lovely that that you've kind of brought that in um to the conversation I think it's really important, Louise, you know, you know, having spent time in the Amazon, having drunk a lot of various exotic medicines from all over the world. And, and you know, uh, I, I love all the plants. I'm just going to say that up front. As some of them have kicked my ass a few times and some of them have been a bit more gentle and some of them are humorous. But I love them all because they've all shown me something. They've all taught me something. They've all healed something within me. But in the end, what I realized, you don't have to go to Peru or to the Amazon to drink ayahuasca or any of these other medicines. You can step outside your front door take two steps, look down, and you'll see a dandelion growing between the cracks. Dandelion is one of the most powerful medicines on the planet right now. And it's also one of the most important for a whole bunch of reasons I'd like to share. But that tells me that, you know, you can have a shamanic experience with almost any plant if you know how. Sure, there's a bit of, you know, learning and training and practice and all the rest of it. But once you step into that space, particularly with a plant like dandelion, which is so powerful, you realize that the medicine is everywhere. It's growing in the cracks. It's growing in the hedge outside of your house. You know, you can step into the field behind you and you probably, well, in Wales, you might find magic mushrooms or you might find <laughs> other medicine, you know. So it's just like, that's the beauty of nature. And, and, and I guess for people like me, that's why plant consciousness as an event was so important. And that's what Ayahuasca wanted us to do was to open up that space and show that this is not just, you know, there's that thing called plant blindness where people don't see plants. And it's like, that's a huge part of Western culture. And plant consciousness is really about removing that plant blindness and saying, just take a second, have a look down and see what plants are around you. And then maybe go away and read up on them and wonder why you took that moment to connect with that plant. Because there's always a reason that a plant will reach out to you. And, um, you know, plants like mugwort, for example, well, that's one of the, the plants that we used to work with really at a, I wouldn't say beginner level because that's perhaps not quite the right word, but as a, on a plant spirit healing level, mugwort is incredibly uh, visceral. Mm -hmm. And we used to run plant diet retreats with her uh, and we'd have people that had, would come along because Mugwort's also a dreaming plant, right, mm -hmm. uh, who hadn't hadn't dreamt or so they fought for for like decades. Mm -hmm. And we would give them uh, the special elixir that we would make from Mugwort on the first day. And then we'd have a dream share the following uh, following morning as part of the retreat. And I remember the last one we did, there was one lady who swore blind that she'd not dreamt for, I don't know, must have been 20 years or something. And she came in and she said, you will not believe I've written pages and pages. <laughs> and pages of all of these dreams. And she said, Mugwort came to me so strongly in my dream space. And she's like, wow, 
I, that's the first time I've dreamt in 20 years and it's the first time I've remembered it and it's the first time I've met a plant spirit, which is why we work with Mugwort because she's incredibly visceral. She is really easy to connect to. You don't necessarily have to work with other medicines like mushrooms or something to connect with her. She, I, and, and it's so interesting to hear people's stories of Mugwort because like with me, you know, she literally stopped me in my tracks and I knew seconds before I met her that I was going to meet her. In fact, I'll share the story. It was in Abergavenny many years ago. We'd gone on a little nature walk uh, for those people that know um, Abergavenny in Wales, around the Castle Meadows, with a, a lovely lady who was doing a little sort of plant talk. And we were just about to walk out into the meadows from the botanical garden, and his voice came to me in my head. He said, oh, you're going to meet Mugwort in a minute. I'm like, what? Where did that come from? And then literally, as that thought had entered my head, the, the woman running the group, she said, oh, I just want to take you out here into the field because there's a plant I really want to show you. Hold on a second. And she opened again. She said, there it is. It's Mugwort. And I was just like, what the hell? And that was how Mugwort introduced herself um, to me. I mean, it, it, she'd already been in my awareness a little bit anyway, but I didn't know what she looked like. I didn't even know, know anything, really. Mm -hmm. And that began... The relationship that to this day is still one of my deepest relationships of any plants. I've done so many diets and retreats with Mugwort and she has protected me and assisted me in healings. And I still work with her for certain types of entity extraction because I do very similar work to you. I have to work in the shadows being four planets in Scorpio. That's just part of the gig, um, you know, and you'll know that too. And um, so that's, you know, I mean, Mugwort isn't a plant that grows everywhere, but she is fairly, fairly widely available in, in Britain. And I mean, once you get into the history of Mugwort, and this is where you start to get the identity of the plants, is this is a plant that's had human interaction for well over a thousand years. So there is a thousand years of human Mugwort co-creation, you know, uh, co-interaction. This is what I was just going to say about um, what Zach had said. He said, you have to remember from the other side of the fence, David, that, that the plants are also evolving with you. Every time you come up with a new healing technique with them in sacred space to help your clients, they're also evolving. They're also on their own journey. And that's why they love this work in the quantum space, because it's giving them the opportunity to work with humans in the 3D in a way that they've never got to work before. So this is where you, when you really understand that they're a conscious intelligence, a spirit, or whatever, they're also still evolving. The universe is still expanding, right? And so I think that that, that for me, and this is what me and Pam have talked about a lot on the um, videos, is this idea of the new earth is, is in that co-creative quantum space with Mother Earth, with the plants and the trees and the fungi and all of everything that's here. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just thinking, um, because, you know, I don't know where the audience is in regards to their knowledge and awareness of working with plants or how confident or comfortable they are. So where would be a great place for somebody to start if they wanted to kind of get into starting to work with plant consciousness, starting to to work on a on a more co-creative, collaborative um, journey? So the one plant that I would really recommend right now for that is dandelion. And uh, I'll just show a little bit about that. So, you know, dandelion is well known as a herbalist plant, uh, particularly for liver cleanses. You know, the liver is also where we hold anger. So it's good for cleansing our anger. So, so the, you know, there's lots of this kind of information that's easily accessible that starts to give you an idea mm -hmm. about dandelion. Um, for me, uh, the most interesting thing that Dandelion taught me is that, he, first of all, he's a time lord. He has complete mastery over time. And he really showed me in depth that the only thing that exists is the present moment, that the past is all active right now. The past is still an active thing going on in a parallel time stream. The future never comes. So the future is always the future. It never exists. Uh, and so he really brought me into the present moment. And what he showed me was that every moment is divine and every moment is absolutely perfect. And whatever is going on in that moment is perfect and what's meant to be going on. Yeah. So once I, I was just like, okay, that's, you know, yeah, I'm sure I've heard that before. But once I started to actually live and breathe that and experience, and that's how I ended up in Mexico, was just following divine guidance, divine intuition in every moment, trusting, 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 to the point where I don't really worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't worry about what's going to happen in the Ukraine. It's like my truth is like this. And my truth is about the new earth. And that, that's my truth. And from a fifth dimensional perspective, it already exists. And I'm in it. I'm experiencing it. Mm -hmm. And that's what dandelion tells us just like every moment is perfect and you know a great place to start would be to take dandelion essence for three weeks to do a kind of an essence protocol and what you start to realize with dandelion because he really i mean he's a very humorous character anyway but he really brings the present moment into your awareness by synchronicities mm -hmm. but also by answering intention so i mean maybe some of your audience are aware of this too but right now manifestation is almost instant we have to be very careful about what we think about because we can manifest things we don't want by having idle throwaway thoughts you know 
as a Buddhist student, we were taught we have to have right, right thoughts, right actions, and uh, right words. And I, I, I got the words and the, the actions, uh, you know, uh, at that time, but I was just like, but no one really knows what's going on inside my head. So what does it really matter what I think, right? <laughs> Then I realized that at 5D level, we can absolutely read each other's thoughts. <laughs> and if you have strong thoughts about people that are unpleasant, they're going to feel it. That's a kind of a form of unconscious black magic. Yeah. So once I started to get into the shamanic path and I realized that, I'm just like, oh, my God, I have such a responsibility to think about what goes on inside my head. I need to keep my thoughts clean and pure and happy and all of them things. Right. You know, and so. All of this is, this is the, the space that we're moving into right now. So dandelion right now, I would recommend for two reasons. I would get essence and I would get tincture. The tincture I, or capsules, I would take to cleanse out the liver. Better still go into the garden, pick dandelion leaves, put some dandelion leaves in your smoothie. Um, you can even make a dandelion shot juice if you've got one of those juices, they're also great. And I mean, it's such potent medicine for the liver, it really is. Mm -hmm. But that will also help clear out the anger that may still be you know, stored there. It will help detox the liver of those kinds of toxic metals. I mean, everybody, I think pretty much ubiquitously on the planet yeah. right now has been exposed to some pretty severe heavy metal poisoning, mm -hmm. uh, not just from what's been going on the last two years, but prior to that too, with the chemtrails and 5G, I mean, I have a friend, and this is a story for another time, but she's an expert in viral conditions. And we've been talking about a lot of what we believe could be the um, so-called effects of COVID actually come down to being activated Epstein-Barr virus in the system. Most of the symptoms that people uh, have expressed that could be described as being COVID could actually also be uh, heavy metal triggering Epstein-Barr virus. And this is the interesting thing, right? I'd like to share this. I did a journey to meet the spirit of Epstein-Barr virus, because I've, I mean, I had glandular fever when I was a kid and I didn't realize I'm a long-term sufferer of Epstein-Barr virus, as are most Westerners actually. And it had been manifesting in my body my entire adult life as just ongoing physical pain that I can never get to the bottom of. Mm -hmm. Until uh, my friend, uh, the nutritionist, uh, her name's Rebecca O'Reilly, I definitely recommend checking out her work on, on the internet. Um, and she uh, recommended doing a six week liver detox. And so I did that. And for the first time, I actually followed the detox program all the way for the six weeks. And I got down to some very, very um, old stuff in my liver that then triggered, um, you know, this release from when I was eight years old, which had triggered glandular fever. So something happened to me at eight that heavily toxified my body that activated Epstein-Barr. So I did a journey to meet the spirit of Epstein-Barr. And to my surprise, he appeared to me as an ancient Celtic ancestor from the other world. And I was like, okay, that's not what I was expecting. And I said, well, you know, who are you? And he said, I'm part of your immune system. He said, viruses are part of your immune system. They're not transmissible. They're not contagious. They're actually in their natural form, something that gets triggered in your body when an alien energy comes in. And I don't necessarily mean ETs, but a foreign energy comes into your body that the virus gets activated and then triggers the release, which will often be like a fever or something. Yeah. So he said to me, I only get activated in you when your heavy metal toxicity goes over 10% of your kind of your overall energy field. And that started to make me think about the, the mythology we have around the elves and the other world, why they hate iron, why they hate metal. That then led me into a whole journey with the stuff I've done with the You Mysteries with, with Michael Dunning, which is about how when the sun came into our universe, uh, the, the other world was very yin, that's, that's her story, that's the feminine old world. When the sun came into our universe or was brought into our universe, it created uh, this much more 3D individuated sense of self, the masculine yang energy. Yeah. And so as, as is written about in the story, some of the elves, as we will call them, which, or the she, or I, I kind of think they're actually Palladians, they were originally Palladian people that came here a long, long time ago. Uh, some of them decided to stay in that kind of other world existence and some some people uh, decided to cross over and become manifest. But in order to do that, we needed metals to make us into a physical form. Mm. So there's a balancing act here where we need a certain level of metals to be manifest. But if we have too much, then it starts to activate all of these things in our body, which is when our ancient ancestor steps forward and says, hey, I'm going to bring up this condition that's like fogginess or body pain to tell you that you're overly toxified and you need to detox. Mm. And I was just like, wow, <laughs> that's just, you know, I did this, this was about eight months ago when I was, you know, going through all of this stuff. And I just thought, wow, that makes so much sense with so many things that explains about the mythology of our elves and iron and steel and metal. But it also explains a lot of the conditions going on. It also explains why so many people have got heavy metal poisoning. You know, heavy metal poisoning uh, and liver issues can also result in eczema in children. 
And when I asked my friend, you know, how come children can get so heavily toxified? She said, because it's ancestral. It's carried by the mother through the womb. So if the mother is heavily toxified, the baby will be born that way. So if you look that back 150 years to the Industrial Revolution, all of our recent ancestors were all working in coal mines, iron furnaces, quarries, all breathing in heavy metal dust. Yes. So almost ubiquitously, that's why most of Westerners have got activated Epstein-Barr virus. So dandelion is great for this. Dandelion can help clear out some of this toxicity in our liver reduce the anger the frustration that we might be feeling about things right now but also what you'll see with dandelion is that you can make intentions and prayers and they can be answered really really quickly you know that's where you get to learn how good your prayers are you know it's oh i didn't mean for that to happen or that's not quite what i thought was going to happen you know um so this is also you know dandelion's great at making us be very precise about what we think about and what we ask for and then how do we express that through the word and then how does that translate and so you know th this is just dandelion this is just one plant right and this is all what i've learned from dandelion and a whole bunch more you mm. know another thing about dandelion is that he's a master geneticist there are like thousands literally so many different varieties of dandelion that they gave up trying to classify all of them and then they investigated why and it's because dandelion can literally change his dna at will so dandelion can adapt to any environment that he wants to, which is why he grows in the cracks in the pavements. And, you know, so when you think about that in this moment and you think about all the stuff that we're hearing about DNA and strands and genetics and blah, 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 mm -hmm. conscious genetic choices to change with gene therapy or whatever, then you've got a plant like dandelion who can do that himself so that he can adapt <laughs> to any environment. And he shows us that we can do the same thing. We don't need to take it from somewhere else. We can change our DNA ourselves by being this much more fluid, energetic being that's somehow manifested into a 3D form. Yeah, actually that, so much of what you're saying is, I mean, it's so much of what you're saying is directly related to the channelings that have been coming through me, just because I've always been a channel my whole life kind of thing. But it's just like, yeah, you know, shifting from that rigid structure, internal rigid structure to that more fluid form, um, you know, and, and, all that that represents in our in our mental constructs, our emotional flow, and just being in that moment and being exactly as you are in that moment, and just you know allowing yourself to be more fluid and shifting. One of the plants that's really coming up for me, and I know it's one that you've mentioned and that you wanted to mention, is wormwood. Um, it's just been coming mm. into my awareness like crazy. Um, and each time I go to the, the herbalist, they're like, oh, wormwood, oh, no, you know, I wouldn't kind of recommend just, um, and it's just like, but it's, it's shouting at me, it's screaming at me. So why would that be so? What, what is it that wormwood wants to bring to the table for us, not just me, but for, for all of us at this time? Yeah, a good question. I mean, uh, Wormwood has been shouting at me for years. I've worked with Wormwood for about six years now. I've grown her from seed. I've, I, I mean, I've been I've dieted, done so many parasite cleanses. I've done lots of mushroom ceremonies working with Wormwood. Uh, I mean, Wormwood is a shadow plant mm -hmm. and Wormwood's world is shadowy. Uh, why? Because Wormwood can completely remove the veil so that your third eye can see everything that's going on. Now, most people think that sounds great until you start to realize that we live in a world of lies, illusion and deceit, and you get to see all of it up close. Mm. And that was my first experience with Wormwood. Thankfully, I'd already done enough plant medicine and you know, had done enough shamanic work not to be too bothered by that. I'm all, even before I did the plant work, I was already pretty empathic and pretty intuitive anyway. Yeah. So my world was already like that. Wormwood just kind of amplified it for me. The main reason that Wormwood, I believe, has been onto people like me. I mean, she's, you know, I've been talking about Wormwood solidly for several years now because she insisted you have to tell as many people as possible about me because I'm going to be needed. Mm. The question is why? Why? Um, Wormwood is highly anti-parasitic. Mm. And she's also, and this is a little bit more out there, she's also very, very highly anti-parasitic with off-planet parasitic energies. Right. Right. Uh, I mean, Wormwood is even in the book of Revelation. She, she's uh, listed when the third angel blows uh, his trumpet, a star appears and the star's name is Wormwood and Wormwood makes the water bitter and many men will die. And I just think, wow, that, I only came across that recently and I'm just like, Wormwood's actually mentioned by name in the Bible as a star being. And I've encountered Wormwood in many, many ways as a kitchen witch, as the green absinthe fairy, um, and as a star being. And, as, as, you know, I mean, primarily the Artemisias as a clan, as a plant family, they're all witches. They're all very non-dual beings, you know, tr a true witch, so like a raffle bikini, so to speak. And Wormwood is very like that too. 
And the reason that, and I mean, ivermectin, I believe is made from wormwood. So that starts to give you an idea of why wormwood is important. We are living in a world that is now heavily infected uh, from a lot of what has happened uh, without necessarily needing to go into the details. There's a lot of energies, parasitic energies that have been transmitted across the entire population. And wormwood is the plant that actually gets rid of them. Mm -hmm. I've done, you know, so many parasite cleanses and I've done one again in the last 12 months. Why? So that for six months, my energy field is like almost being fumigated by wormwood. What that does is it stops those parasitic beings, energies from entering into your energy field, because if they do, it will kill them. Now, I did a, <laughs> the reason I know this for sure is because I once did a mushroom ceremony whilst in the middle of a, um, a wormwood parasite cleanse. And the medicine was really strong and we put wormwood essence into the brew and we had wormwood on the altar. And so it, it was a mushroom journey, but very much through the filter of wormwood. Mm. And about 15 minutes into the journey, when the, the mushroom medicine came on strong, I got this very strong sense of being fumigated and like things dying. And I'm like, oh, my God, like, what's all this? And then wormwood appeared in my way. And she said, hey, what did you expect? I'm killing the parasites in your body. What did you think it was going to look like? <laughs> I'm like, oh, I didn't. I didn't really think about it to be honest. He said, "Hey, man, you 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 wanted to do the the parasite cleanse. You wanted to do the mushroom, Jenny. There you go. What do you want from me? This is what's going on right now." <laughs> so on the one hand, it was kind of yucky being this kind of you know in this sort of fumigatory space of wormwood at work and experiencing it in the very sort of astral energy, but at the same time, just like, hey, right, yeah, wormwood's a killer. She kills parasites. Mm. You know, um, herbalists will tell you that wormwood could be toxic for the liver. Look, man, I've been taking wormwood for years. My liver's perfectly fine. Uh, I think as long as you have a clear intention with the plant that it's not going to hurt you, the plant will never hurt you. Plants don't want to hurt us. They want to make us better. And so I think there's a lot of, honestly, a lot of hyperbole out there about this kind of stuff. Also plants like St. John's War and the photo sensitivity. Plants don't want to hurt us. I've even been poisoned by plants numerous times and should have died. And they're like, we're not going to kill you. We want to show you something. Mm. You know, so when you're in that mindset of trust with the plants there is no fear i know that a plant is never going to kill me why would it want to in the same way you know anyone who's ever drunk wormwood tea will know that it's so bitter you'd be hard put to put so much wormwood in your body that it would kill you because it's just like wow to get that much wormwood in is difficult you know but you get to a point where you don't need to keep you know putting the wormwood in i work with wormwood essence and i've been working with wormwood for like six or seven years so she's very much you know in terms of a frequency attuned to me and so i only really have to think of when if i need to work with her i call her into her space and we work together to remove energies mm. um and i can do that on myself and so that's how i've kept myself pretty clean clear and you know i haven't been sick really at all in the last two years louise of anything mm. at all and that's partly because the moment anything comes into my field, I remove it energetically. And I think that's also worth um, sharing that disease starts off, everything starts off as energy. Yes. It's once energy gets into our body, it starts to manifest as cancer, tumor, dis-ease. Mm -hmm. So if we stop it at source by addressing the energy origin, which could be trauma, or it could be, you know, some uh, weakness in our energy field... Mm -hmm. then we never get sick again. So the only thing I'm really ever dealing with is the long-term effects of Epstein-Barr virus because I've had that since I was a kid. I haven't really been sick in the last 10 years with anything. I've mm -hmm. had a couple of moments where I've been exposed to some of the stuff that's going on right now and it made me temporarily sick for an hour or two until I went home, opened a sacred space, removed the energy and, and removed whatever was making me feel a little bit icky. When I chat to other people, that kind of experience put them on their back for two or three weeks and they couldn't get out of bed. I'm like, yeah, it's because you didn't remove the energy of it or you didn't remove it quickly enough. This, I believe, is the healthcare of the future because once we understand that everything is energy yeah. and it's up to us whether we allow it into our system, it's a conscious choice of whether we allow illness in, you know, and it might not always seem like that, but on some level it is a conscious choice. Once we decide that we're not going to do that anymore, then, then we don't get sick. <laughs> No, absolutely. Um, one of the modalities that, that I use, um, it's interesting because we go through a process of, you know, how is this actually benefiting you? And you don't think that actually something that is causing disease, as it were, within your system, there would be an aspect of you that is connected in any way to it being beneficial. But there is, because when you ask those questions and you're in that moment and you're just giving the answers, it's quite incredible. Um, yeah. So, you know, there's a lot going on unconsciously subconsciously that we have no idea that our energy field is connected into 
kind of connected to everything. I mean, we are part of the web of weird, the web of all it is. Yes. And I think that this is the big separation process we're seeing right now is how connected are we to ourselves? And then how connected are we to, to the land that we stand on? Mm -hmm. And what are the effects I'm seeing of what's going on in the world is complete disconnection. And most people I think are already quite disconnected, but mm -hmm. the processes that some people have allowed to happen to themselves have completely disconnected them to the point where their, their higher self is almost not present in their body anymore. I've had a few clients where I'm like, wow, it's actually really difficult. Their higher self has gone so far away from their body. I'm not really sure what's actually in control here in the body anymore. You know, and I think that that's, that's a big question for all of the healers and shamans out there right now working at the energy level is what are we experiencing? What are we seeing? What is actually going on here? Rather than listening to the 3D end of things getting explained by scientists on TV, which is great, or you're not TV or alternative media, that's still the end of the tow rope. That's, that's still looking at it allopathically. We need to go to the origin of what's going on and say, hey, let's deal it at the origin. And that's when we start to get into the more far out stuff because you realize that the origin is something very, very different from the end result. So I'm not necessarily gonna to get too out there on this particular call, but you know, I, I think you know what I'm talking about. And it, it's, this is the space that we're moving into where we understand everything at that level. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, we've probably everyone who's listening to this menu, we've all been sick at some point with something and you wonder how does it happen? But like you just said, every time I get sick now, it's a chance for me to go, hold on a second. Yeah. Or, you know, you know, not that I've been sick recently, but how, how did that get in? What's the thing in me that allowed that to get in? Why did I allow myself to feel with this ease about that? That's when everything becomes a teaching. And that's when we stop being a victim. We don't have to go to the doctors anymore. We start becoming our own doctors. And that's where the plants and the plant intelligence has helped me over the last 10 years because they've shown me consistently, aha, see this pain down here, uh, David? That's actually something going on energetically to do with this, this, and this. Oh, wow. So if I heal that, will this go? Yes. So that's what I learned and that's how it works. And that's why I don't get sick anymore. Because I always, the moment I feel a slight tremor in my um, frequency in my field, I'm like, what, what on earth is that? Why, why was I feeling amazing this morning and now I don't feel so good? Ah, well, I went into town and I went to that cafe and it was all a bit icky in there. And maybe something's just got a little bit stuck to my field and maybe I just need to clean it. Like that, if you leave that though, as most people would, that yeah. can work through from the mental body through the emotional body. Then once it's into the emotional body, it's getting all this energy and maybe it's attracting an entity that then triggers situations and blah, 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 blah. Next thing, it's into the etheric body and then it's into the physical body and next thing, you're sick. That's how it works, you know? And it's, I think that as a society, once we start to move more to looking at things in this way, we'll be like our ancestors. You know, if you go into the ancient king lists of Ireland and our ancestors lived for hundreds of years and people say, oh, that can't be true. It's just mythology. And I'm like, well, if we never get sick and we're always in a place of ease, we will live longer because why wouldn't we? Yeah. Because we're healthy beings. So I believe that we're going to start, I mean, I don't know what the immediate future is for all humanity, but I could see in one way that, that we could become much more, um, present with our higher selves but because we've got this understanding of quantum energy that we will actually live a lot longer because we, we don't really have anything to make us sick so there's nothing really to age us anymore i don't know i mean this is just uh, something no, to no, I, no it's actually exactly what i channeled through on my introductory conversation on the summit you know it's oh, like great. <laughs> you know this concept of time it's not 24 hours that's a completely man-made concept anyway but you know a moment can last a thousand years you know who's to say and who's to say what the how long these bodies can go for and how regenerative they can be if we stop allowing ourselves to ingest or let in you know that which is causing disharmony yeah. within the yeah. field you know so also, yeah time and its very nature is not always the same we're living in a moment we have been now uh, for, for the last year or so where time is incredibly accelerated so this means that things happen very quickly it means that releases can happen very quickly but it, you know it ha means everything can happen very quickly but we've also been living in the, in the last sort of the last yuga the last year with very very dense heavy energy and our ancestors didn't live in that kind of energy. They lived on a planet that A, had a lot more trees, so they lived in plant consciousness all the time, but they also lived at a time when the energy is what I believe we're now moving back into, which is a much more light and more expansive experience that is less, uh, I mean, our ancestors were a lot bigger than us too. They were, you know, it's yeah. giants in comparison. We've been steadily shrinking. And that's partly, I think, because of the psychic pressure, because of the denseness of the energy of this era. And, you know, this is what the Buddhists call, um, how do they say now? Yeah, they've got a phrase for it. 
Like it will come to me. It's gone. Something <laughs> like the uh, the age of desperados or something like that. Um, it will come. But it's kind of the point being is that this has been an age where we've been really in the darkness. And now I, I believe what I saw um, on winter solstice because I did a big journey on the winter solstice uh, back in December. I saw the embryonic new earth being birthed uh, as an energy. And what I saw was that the embryonic new earth was made up of like, like a patchwork of lots of people's prayers and intentions. But because we're not a unified society right now, it was kind of a bit piecemeal. And so I think that's how things are going to go. The new earth is already here. It's really starting to manifest quite strongly now, but we have to put our attention solely to that. If we're still getting pulled into party gay or the war in Ukraine or what Biden's going to mumble about next or whatever, you know, or whatever the situation in Canada is today, that I believe is a big trick. I think that that's still pulling our energy into the matrix, into the illusion and stopping us from thinking about what new earth looks like to us. And I really believe right now that new earth can manifest for each and every one of us if we're clear about how it looks for us. And again, I've just channeled an activation, which will be my free <laughs> gift, which is all about birthing the new templates. <laughs> there we go. We're on the plant spirit tip. This is how it works. Synchronicities, you know. Absolutely. But I would really urge all of the listeners out there to, to take this seriously, because I really, now that I've stepped back and I'm in a much more different space. I mean, I was, you know, I'm a politics graduate. I've followed all of this stuff for years. I'm a history buff. I mean, I love the drama. I love the theatre of it all. But from the Eagles Perch perspective, from a 5D perspective, you see that it's all a performance all of it doesn't matter whether it's Keir Starmer here or Boris there or Biden or Trump it's like they're all in the performance together because it's all the matrix it's all the illusion and what we're being asked to do is to completely step out of that but it's so hard because the matrix are our parents we're, we're like adolescents really as a, as a race right and the matrix are our parents and so without their support without the healthcare system the education all that stuff that we have been taught that we need from them but actually is really detrimental to us and actually makes us a slave to the system you know, we have to let go of all of those things, but it's so hard because the system has us with our bank balances, with our internet account, with our mobile phone contract, all things which we can't do without, right? <laughs> you know, so I, you know, and, and um, there's an astrologer I like called Kai Patcher, which I'm sure you've heard of, and um, many of the audience will have watched. And he, he did a great one this week talking about this and saying, what can you let go of? Where are you still attached? Mm. Because if we want to be individual sovereign beings, that means, literally being sovereign by ourselves, not attached to family members not attached to our job to the pub to the holiday to whatever it's like how do i survive without all of that stuff how do i exist in the world by myself mm -hmm. big question and you realize once you get into it that we're very codependent people most of us and, you know whether it's in personal relationships in job relationships and it's like once you step outside of all of that it's scary what do i hold on to nothing it's yeah. just you on the earth, brother. That's it. There's nothing to hold on to except where your feet are in the ground. And that's I it. I got a, I got a message um, because <laughs> my relationship broke down and, you know, I am kind of letting go, energetically letting go of an awful lot of things, a lot of these yeah. attachments. And Red Kite reminded me that what I'd been manifesting and the importance of words and what you're putting out there is I'd been manifest i've been calling out freedom and joy and red kite reminded me that it's just as well i put joy in there <laughs> we have no idea what we're calling in in reality from an egoic perspective and freedom is just that freedom from all attachment freedom from everything you know literally losing anything everything and everything so it's just you and the earth and that's it <laughs> i mean you know I had a profound experience last week. I mean, uh, without going into the details, I arrived at a space here in Mexico that, that is new earth. It's totally, it, you know, um, it's a story for another time. But in the process of landing and grounding here and realizing that I was actually free of everything, it totally freaked me out. Mm. I was almost grasping, where's the drama? Where's the situation? And he's like, ah, yeah, yeah, because I'm Scorpio, right? Everything's super intense and there needs to be a drama for it to be somehow meaning. And, and that was all removed. And I thought, <laughs> oh my God, what happens if new earth turns out to be really boring? what am I going to do you know so I had that was my that was my drama for the day was that for and then that's just like you know and I was but this was all going on while I was watering plants and just you know being in the garden and just kind of in that space and then it dawns on me it's just like dude you're freaking out because you're totally free I'm like oh my god I am oh my god I've been praying for freedom my entire life and now I've got it I'm freaking out why because I'm not used to it 
I don't know what it feels like. I've never been totally free. There's always been something else to do, another email to send, another person that I have to go and do something for, you know, in, in my marriage or my work situation. There's always a, a compromise or a dynamic, right? And we've been taught that we have to compromise in our relationships. And I'm starting to think maybe that's not true. I'm kind of working from this premise of like, how do I meet everybody from this point forward as my equal and as my opposite? How do I meet them in that space without judgment, without anything? Mm. And whether male, female, whatever, race, color, whatever, it doesn't matter. Once we start to engage in that, that's how we can start to work with common law, for example. Mm. How do I make an agreement with this person that I've mm. met that is not bound by any other stupid laws that some other idiots made? This is about what I'm agreeing with this person in this moment. And when we make the agreement, that's the agreement. And we shake hands on it. And that, that's enough. It's based on trust and it's based on love and respect. But that can only happen if we meet each other as equals and opposites. And oh. I think that this is the space that we're moving into, particularly with divine feminine and sacred masculine, which has been so absent from our world for so long, mm -hmm. is that if we want to birth something new, we have to have that divine interaction. Mm -hmm. And we're living in a time when that's being subverted in so many ways, uh, not just by the pharmaceutical processes going on, but by the whole movement that wants to, you know, basically um, bring in 150 different genders or whatever, all of which is completely fine. But at the same time, what that's doing is pulling us away from that creative energy that can only happen with divine um, interaction between male and female. That normally results in the birth of a child, right? Or it can do. But, you know, males also have a womb. We also have an energetic womb from which we can birth creative ideas. And so it's about that energy coming together and fusing for creativity. Yes. That's how a new earth is birthed through that fusion we can't have a lopsided new earth that's more masculine or more feminine or more this more that we did her story we've just done his story now it's our story right mm -hmm. how do we come into this new space so that it's ours it's not yours or mine but ours right and it has to be birthed through these kinds of divine you know interactions between male and female and it doesn't necessarily have to mean intimacy or intercourse it can also be in an energetic way and again i'm seeing that meeting people at a 5d level we can have those conversations, or at least I can have those conversations with the higher selves of people. Everything mm -hmm. gets agreed there. So yeah. when we meet in the 3D, it's already sort of sorted. It's like, oh, okay, it's already done. No, no need to get into a big drama about it. We've already agreed that it's all fine. Energetically, I feel like I trust you, you trust me. That's it, what else is there? Yeah. But because we've got all this distortion in our normal world that comes through the astral planes, which is how this whole, um, this whole piece has happened. I mean, everything that's happened over the last two years is astral uh, distortion. From mm -hmm. off-planet beings who who use that space to intimidate us energetically however from a 5d perspective none of it exists it's just it's just intimidation yeah the trick is that they we've been uh, allowed to believe that it's real once we remove that from our awareness we realize that it's not true and actually the truth is whatever we decide to create yeah you know because in duality Light and dark are just two sides of the same coin. There is, there is no good, there is no bad. And, and the light is always working through the dark. It's yeah. a very, you know, this is a big meditation to sit with because then you have to start letting go of lots of things about all the bad guys in the world, all the people that you hated. They're all doing us a favor, Boris. It's collapsing the system for us. Thank you, Boris. Absolutely. <laughs> Somebody had to bring down the system, so he's doing it for us. And he, I mean, you know, we, we've nicknamed him the, the mascot of mayhem because everything he touches becomes like mayhem. I've actually quite become, you know, quite fond of the guy because he's so catastrophically bad that he can't help but, you know, be amusing at the same time. And it's only if you're attached to the construct of the system that you find that disturbing. I'm not attached to it at all. So I can watch it from a distance and go, hey, man, whatever, that's kind of funny. You know, look what Boris is doing next. Sure, parties in, you know, number 10 during the lockdown down why is nobody asking the question you know which is obvious it's like weren't they worried about the killer virus on the loose why didn't they have the masks yeah. or social distancing they clearly weren't as worried about this killer virus as they were telling us that we should be nobody's asked that question you know so it's kind of like everyone's oh but how come they got to have parties and we didn't it's like see the distraction yeah. away from your point here you know and, and so once you start to see the, the, the performance in the theater in that way it starts to become a lot less stable. And that really allowed me to kind of go, you know what, it's time to eject from that and time to do something different. And I, I guess we'll all come to that place in our own way, but I would really urge the listeners out there to, to kind of think about this and ask yourself, what do I want my reality to look like? Mm. Not what am I receiving from somebody else? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. 
I'm just aware of the time and there's a couple mm. of questions that are in the chat box. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so Kate is asking about snowdrops. Yeah. Um, is there anything yeah. about snowdrops? Because she's been really drawn to them. She loves them. Um, she, she walks on the South Downs. She's in the UK, Kate. So snowdrop is an essence that, uh, that I've made. It's in um, the plant consciousness range. Um, I mean, there are obvious things about snowdrop. It's the beginning of spring. It's about new beginnings. Um, you know, fresh shoots, fresh inspiration, all of the energy. I mean, Snowdrop is a plant that really embodies the energy of spring, I think. But, you know, it's, it's linked to uh, Imolk or St. Bridget's Day, um, which is traditionally in the Celtic calendar, the first day of spring. Um, what I would also say about Snowdrop, Snowdrop is about community because it grows in clusters and communities. Mm. And what is really unusual about Snowdrop, I came to find that Snowdrop can heal animal traumas in human. It has a very, very strong connection to the bovine world weirdly nice. and one of my journeys with snowdrop when i was dieting with her buffalo calf woman appeared to me and i'd already had some interesting interactions with snowdrop to do with animals and to, to particularly to do with cows so uh, you know this is where the plant spirit work often gets us out of our head and i'm like well that's that's weird but i've i've healed people who've had traumas from working abattoirs or working in vets from seeing animals chopped up they had the trauma of that visual in them and snowdrop can heal that nice. um so, you know, this is where I find the plant spirit work gets interesting because it gets us out of our heads so that we can learn things like dandelion teaches us about divine timing or snowdrop, you know, can teach us about how to heal animal traumas. And, you know, I don't know what the spirit of snowdrop is. Maybe the spirit of snowdrop is buffalo calf women, you know, both star beings, you know. So, I mean, really and truly, um, I would say snowdrop right now is about calling in the new beginning of something. And if you take it in conjunction with dandelion, it'll be in the perfect moment. So you've got nothing to worry about. And that's the killer teaching from dandelion is that everything is always perfect, always perfect. So no need to stress about anything. Even if you're feeling like it's the worst day of your life, it's probably happening for a really good reason. You just don't know what it is yet. Maybe you've just been made redundant, maybe because that job you needed to let go of because it's holding you into the system. You know, all of these things. And it's just like, I think if we can come to a place of really flipping everything, that seems like a bad thing going, hold on a second, where's the health here? What, what's, what, what am I getting out of this? And everything becomes a joyful experience, even if it's being painful, you know, okay. so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you've mentioned a couple of times about plant diets. So what do you mm, exactly mean? So just, you know, in case yeah. people are kind of thinking, well, what is a plant diet? Is that vegetarianism? <laughs> <laughs> yeah so originally plant diets and i'll try and keep this brief plant diets is something that comes out of south america um so typically a maestro and it's normally in conjunction with ayahuasca because that opens up a much more sort of energetic astral space where it's much easier to connect with the plant spirits um in that way so normally um you'll be isolated in the jungle for 10 days month two months i mean the periods um this is in the amazon anyway the periods can can be different and normally you spend time alone in a hut and you eat very very simple food normally rice and plantain and think and water maybe that's it normally not allowed to have any red meat any salt anything like that and you are given a tea or a brew of the plant that you're dieting with. So it could be something like Sananga or Bobinsana or even could just even be ayahuasca. I mean, I've done quite a few ayahuasca dietas. So during that period, the point is that you're emptying the body out of unhelpful, heavy energy so that you can really be in that light expanded space so that you can connect with the spirits of the, of the plant easily. Um, we did plenty of these in the jungle when we were down there in Ecuador. Uh, normally for a period afterwards, we wouldn't be allowed to eat uh, any red meat, have any intercourse or, uh, you know, any alcohol because that will disturb the frequencies of the, the dieta. So um, one of my teachers, Carol Guy, has written a really good book about this called Sacred Plant Initiations. And she took a sort of a slightly different format and brought it forward to do the plant diet retreats, which is what we used to run with Pam, where we would fast and we would make the special elixir for the weekend, which would be made of, let's just say hawthorn was the plant for the weekend, uh, hawthorn tea, hawthorn tincture, hawthorn distilled water, you know, hawthorn essence. And then we'd make this big brew that we would all drink uh, nine cups of over the weekend. And so our body was literally just filled with pure hawthorn energy. Mm. so that's one way of doing it uh another way of doing it would be a parasite cleanse with wormwood for example this is something i recommend everybody to do if they haven't already done it do the dr hilda clark uh, wormwood parasite cleanse which includes black walnut whole tincture and clove mm. but this is how i did it the first time i introduced wormwood essence 
wormwood tincture and wormwood tea. And I went really, really deep. So the first thing I did when I woke up in the morning was drink wormwood tea. Then I would have wormwood tincture in essence. And then I would have all of the capsules and all of the protocol. But I did it with the intention that I wanted A, to clean out all of the energies and the parasites. But really, I wanted to meet the spirit of wormwood. A lot of this work is intention. Plants are super responsive to intention, if we're clear. Magic mushrooms, for example, very, very responsive to intentions. Um, so, um, so that's one kind of diet. You can also do a, a diet which is much more simple, for example, which is a three week essence protocol. You don't have to fast. You can generally eat whatever you want. You, you know, I mean, I would generally avoid the tox, you know, the toxifying foods and stuff anyway. But, you know, um, keep a diary. I would only if, if you want to meet the spirit of snowdrop, for example, take snowdrop for three weeks, three, three drops, three times a day for three weeks, the free freeze. Or if you know, if you want to be more precise, you can douse on it. How many drops do I need in the morning? How many at lunch? Da, da, da. So you can play around with it. And I think I've done so many different varieties of diets now, and I'm so attuned into the natural kingdom. I don't necessarily need to fast. I, I can maybe smoke some Santa Maria, or I can take some mushrooms, do a journey, take my essence and call the spirit of the plant. And that's how I find out how, how strong my essences are. That's how I test them is by doing a mushroom ceremony and say, I really want to feel the quality of dandelion. Mm. Um, so there are different ways of doing this. And, you know, um, uh, there are good books out there on, on diets, but please, you know, anyone who's listening who wants to learn more, I love talking about plants, as you can probably <laughs> tell. Uh, please feel free to email me at david at wisdomhub.tv and, you know, ask questions. And, you know, for me, a big part of why I'm here right now is to point people into the world of nature and show that this really is the world of healing that we need. We don't need to outsource it to pharmaceutical companies, to doctors. All we have to do is go outside and start talking to Mother Earth again and let, let her heal us. And I believe that almost anything can be healed when we're in that space and if we have the desire and the intention to. Absolutely. Um, April um, has mentioned about doing many different ceremonies, um, Yage mm. and Bufo and Cambo. Um, and she was asking what your thoughts on frog medicine are. Now, I know that this isn't, <laughs> it isn't plant consciousness, which is the topic of the conversation, but do you have any thoughts on frog medicine? Yeah, I mean, this this is probably a whole other talk in itself, but um, I, I I've never I never worked with the toad medicine. It's the only one of the major medicines I've never done. I've done plenty of cambo. Um, in the end, I realised I didn't really need cambo. Uh, it's very violent, um, or it can be, and I'm just like I I do question the need to keep taking cambo. It's meant to be a, a high, it's a bit like um a bit like echinacea or something. It's really meant to be a high impact medicine yeah. for short term use. So I. It's a bit like drinking ayahuasca every month. Yeah. I mean, I went, I've done over 100 ayahuasca ceremonies, but then I was training to be a medicine man, and that was part of my training. And, you know, I drank eight days in a row down in the jungle. We drank tobacco too some days, and it was hardcore, mm -hmm. hardcore, unpleasant, man. I wouldn't wish it on anybody, you know, but that was part of my training to, to learn how to deal with a bunch of stuff. So my suggestion, you know, well, Yahe is another name for ayahuasca. Personally, right now, I would say a couple of things. First of all, be very, very cautious about who you sit with because everybody's in a different space. Our world has been divided in so many ways and the energies of some of the process mm -hmm. have affected people greatly and they don't even know that it's affected them. Mm -hmm. I would personally be very conscious about who I sit in circle with. And if there were people there, I didn't know. I mean, I've always been very conscious about that anyway, but right now it's even more important. I also think that the astral space is a bit of a mess, which mm -hmm. is where we generally go on the ahe or the mushrooms. Uh, I myself have done much more mini dosing with medicine. Uh, I haven't felt particularly inclined to do any big medicine ceremonies for well, about eight months now. I think the last one I did was summer solstice, uh, mainly because the energy is so big and the things that I've experienced, I I'm just glad that I had the training that I've had because otherwise it could have been really quite scary. I mean, there's some big stuff going on energetically and either you've got yeah. the kahunas, so to speak, to, to want to meet that stuff or, or you don't. And I, we're, we're out of time where we're out of time. This is what I keep being told by my plant spirit allies. It's like, this is the final, final order in the last chance saloon for you to sort your stuff out. And if you don't do it now, it's going to hurt big time. And I think it's starting to hurt people big time. It's like, you have to get on top of your stuff, whatever it is, you ain't going to new earth unless the barrel is completely clean because otherwise you're taking the old earth with you. And that's not part of the plan. So, so in relation to Bufo Cambo, I always say, Trust what your body wants you to do rather than being led to do something by somebody else or something you think sounds cool. Uh, I don't particularly feel cool to drinking ayahuasca, bufo or cambo right now. 
Uh, I am working a lot with San Pedro because it's a heart medicine and super protective. I do work a lot with Santa Maria because it's a fifth dimensional consciousness plant. And I believe that it's actually the bridge plant to the new earth because that's most of what I've shared today has come out of the Santa Maria space or a mushroom space in conjunction with the plants. Mm. Um, so I don't know whether that answers the question, but I would be very cautious about the very heavyweight medicines right now, just because I don't think it's the right moment for them. And I, and I love all of the medicines. So I'm saying that without any judgment. No, and I, to be honest with you, I agree with you. When I did ayahuasca, it was back in 2017. <clears throat> and again, one thing that is, is as, you know, it's, it's been as pure as pure can be for me from small childhood, go with your own intuition. Don't ever allow yourself to be guided by what somebody else is telling you you should be doing. Um, when I was in Colombia and I was there to do, I think it was five ceremonies in a row. I only did three because by the third one, I was like, yeah, I'm done. There's nothing at this time that, that ayahuasca needs to teach me, show me anything else. And I said that to the shame and they were like, yeah, cool. You know, and so it is pick your group and don't ever be led by anybody else, which is why for me personally, I think that the the plant consciousness that we have all around us, you know, we don't have to go to the exotic plants, we don't have to go to the big hitters. The energies out there are hitting us big enough. <laughs> For me, <Yeah. laughs> it is about allowing the plant kingdom to support us, allowing the plant kingdom to to cleanse us, to gently guide us. Because yeah, I mean, I'm constantly shown, keep checking your backpack, keep checking what you're dragging behind you clear that stuff out get yourself clean so we can move forward and bring those new earth templates which are already here in into embodiment on that is there, sorry sorry just one more thing to say a difference between the entheogen plants and what i would call the hedgerow plants the entheogen plants they have a much more malleable consciousness they're not of a fixed frequency they're much closer to human consciousness which in some ways is great However, it also means that their frequencies can be tampered with and programmed with other people's or attuned to other people's intentions. Ayahuasca particularly is very dangerous in this regard. And I learned that in the hard way in the jungle, um, seeing how medicine was getting spelled. And I would probably suggest that most medicine outside of the Amazon that's been sent from the Amazon or from South America has also been spelled by the shaman that sent it. So just to put that out there into the awareness, I've seen that plenty. Mugwort is of a fixed frequency that is mugwort. Mugwort cannot be spelled, A, because she's a witch herself, <laughs> but that's what, where I start to see that some of the hedgerow plants like mugwort are actually in some ways, and wormwood especially is like this, are actually more powerful than the entheogens. They're different, it's a different kind of experience. And a lot of people who come into sort of this world of plant consciousness through hedgerow plants are expecting big psychedelic experiences. That does happen, but not in the visual kind of way that you think it would happen on an ayahuasca. And actually, for me, very rarely do I get the big visuals. Even when I drink ayahuasca, I go straight to the place behind the visuals, which is the energy space, which is the only thing I'm interested in. I don't need to see lots of colourful cartoons. I just want to be in the, the space with my allies, with the higher beings, and to let them talk to me. So that's the only reason I take medicine. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to share that too. So do never, ever thing that ayahuasca is a much more powerful plant than dandelion because dandelion is something that grows in a crack outside your front door. Dandelion is as equally powerful as ayahuasca in my opinion, possibly even more. But like I say, all the plants, I love them all. And you know, they're all my favorites. I always say that I have a favorite, but they're all my favorites. You know, so I would just invite everybody listening to kind of approach the outside world in that way and start to see everything as having life and animism and consciousness and once you start to engage with the environment that way, it makes you much more present. And then it makes you realize where you are on the earth and you start to see a lot of things differently. You stop getting pulled into other people's stories. One of the things that we didn't touch upon was the tree essences, but I mean, uh, just consciously aware of the time. Is there anything that yeah. you want to share that's coming through that you really wanted to share before we kind of wrap the conversation up? Sure, let me just see if there's any more questions in there that I haven't really covered. Um, yeah, so, I mean, look, somebody's asking about uh, thistle. I don't know so much about thistle, but of course, milk thistle is a, uh, another great liver cleanser. The thistles are an amazing bunch of families, yeah, amazing family of plants, rather, and there's so many plants out there. You know, I would just really suggest to everybody, again, don't listen to what other people are into. Go out into the garden and feel what calls you. I mean, right now, rosemary is calling me here. I'm going to do a load of rosemary harvesting. And I was thinking, why is Rosemary calling me so strongly? And one of the great qualities of Rosemary is she helps us remember. 
And I'm like, why would that be important right now? It's like, well, it's so obvious, right? Because we need to remember who we are, who we really are, not who we've become by all of the things that we've allowed to receive from other people. It's like, who am I really? It's time to wake up and remember, because if you don't remember now, then when are you going to remember? So this is how it can work. And just allow yourself to be guided. I mean, I've got friends who work with fleabane. I've got friends who work with pineapple weed. And I'm just like, that's the beauty of this, man. You can be a pineapple weed shaman. Wow, you know. <laughs> who would have thought that was such a thing? But there's probably somebody out there who's a pineapple weed shaman. Great. I'm happy for the man, you know, because we can all, you know, as my teacher Pam said, this is probably a good place to end. She said, I believe that you can go deep with any one single plant and it can heal you of anything eventually. And I actually concur with that. I think almost any plant, if you go keep going deeper and deeper and deeper with it, it will keep revealing more and more of yourself. And that's when you'll realise that you can heal yourself. Mm. So, yeah. That is beautiful. <clears throat> that's a beautiful sentiment to, to leave this conversation with. Thank you so much, David, for joining me and for joining the yeah. audience on the Mundane Magical Summit. To everybody, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation, whether you're connecting with it in live or on the replay. That we could go, we could go really deep. We could go in so many different di directions with this topic. So I would love to have you back on the show at some point um, to mm. share even more. Um, tomorrow, guys, we have a pre-recorded interview with with the beautiful holistic dentist daughter Bredgard, and um, who may actually be in the live. I thought I saw her on. Or maybe she's popped off again but um yeah so i'm really looking forward to sharing that with you <clears throat> and then we have another live call on sunday with carrie walters which is all about breath work and journeying of the heart through breath work which i'm really excited to share as well so for now thank you everybody for joining us on this live thank you david again um for your beautiful energy and for your massive amount of wisdom on the plant kingdom plant consciousness and so to everybody have a great rest of your day wherever you are in time and space and i shall see you on again in live on sunday take care everybody bye